Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Jyoti Ghosh to discuss the food crisis and the food prices that have been going up again. Jyoti, the food prices seem to be rising again. 2011 prices have been consistently high. What is the impact that it is having in terms of the global poor, in terms of the third world countries and you know, generally the impact on the people who can least afford the rising price of food? Well, it's actually a horrifying impact because what has been happening in the last, say, four years when pr prices have been very volatile, in periods of globally rising prices, there is an almost direct transmission of this rising price to food prices in the developing world. And in pre periods of falling prices, you don't find that downward movement. It's the first time that we are seeing in the last decades that the number of people hungry are really have, have gone up by a huge number. It's almost 25% increase. Well, this is in fact just what we're estimating. We still don't have the hard data to know what has happened to consumption patterns. But it is quite evident that there is going to be, I, I imagine, a very, very significant impact on nutrition. And when we get the actual data in terms of both the nutrition, uh, you know, how much people are eating in terms of calories and the outcome indicators, I think things are going to be much worse than people imagine. If we look at the consumption baskets, then about say 10 to 12 percent of the basket of goods in an advanced country goes for food. Mm -hmm. But here it can be as high as anything between 50 to 70 percent. So actually the effect would be much, would really be far higher. Yeah, for the poorest, uh, it will be between 50, that is the bottom two deciles or three deciles, it will be between 50 to 70 percent. And even, well, let's say for the, the next group, which is everybody below the top 20 percent, it will be between 40 and 50 percent, which is huge. And what we have found, even little data that we have from the latest national sample survey for India, is that there is a significant increase in the unit value of what people are spending for essentials, wheat, rice, dal, sugar, all these essential items. Now, if we look at the price rise that has taken place, there are three arguments that are given. One, of course, is the imbalance between the demand and the supply, uh, arguing that Indians and the Chinese are eating too much. No, that's ridiculous because, in fact, if you look at it globally, Chinese and Indians are eating less. The consumption of most of the basic food items for which the price has zoomed up, like wheat and rice, has actually fallen. The aggregate consumption has fallen in China and India. But more generally, if you look at global demand and supply, there is really no relationship between the increase in food prices and the behavior of demand and supply. Broadly, they have been more or less in sync. Global demand increases by maybe 4 or 5 percent. Global supply increases by 5 or 6 percent. So there should be no major change in price if you're looking in terms of the FAO data on supply and utilization. So what, is, what explains this kind of volatility in the market and also almost tripling of the prices over the last four or five years? Yes, well, you know, what we found is that prices doubled or tripled between January 2007 and mid-2008. Then they fell again to almost the same level of January 2007. Then they've been rising again. We have now had 13 months of very, very high prices very prolonged period. It's a plateau where we have crossed the earlier peak of June 2008. And this, as I said, is having this huge impact globally across the world, but it's not related to real demand and supply. There's one supply factor which is important, which is the diversion to biofuels. Subsidies on biofuels in the United States and in the European Union have meant something like one third of maize output and half of maize imports for the European Union and about 40% of maize output in the US is diverted to biofuel production. Coupling of the oil prices to in some sense the food prices well, through the biofuel. That's issue. part of the reason but the other thing of course oil prices directly affect food prices because oil enters directly into cultivation because it's the input energy, cost. the input cost, the transport of food. So when oil prices go up, food prices will also go up. It enters directly. But both oil and fuel are, uh, food are actually affected by another third factor, which has really been, in a sense, the dominant reason for the price increase. And that is the financial activity in global commodity markets. Can you explain a little bit? Because 
all of us thought that speculation is something that is inherent in the commodity trading. So what's new in this? No, what's very new is that we now have in the commodities market the activity of financial speculators who have no interest whatsoever in the physical commodity. Earlier in commodity markets, yes, of course, there was speculation. But globally, in fact, in the international commodity markets, that speculation was confined to those who have an interest in the physical holding of the commodity. So large grain traders and you know people like that, uh, or agencies like that would be involved in that. They are not, a large part of the futures market in the global trade was really because of hedging. Because you will either be needing, I mean, let's say, you know, you are McDonald's, you need lots of potato chips. So you hedge for potatoes six months from now. Or you are Cargill, you're a grain trader. So you hedge for your purchases six months from now. What we found now, especially after 2006, is the very active involvement of financial companies that have absolutely no interest in the physical holding of the commodities. This was enabled by financial regulation in the US, which began in 2000, the Commodity uh, Futures Modernization Act. It brought in the possibility of purely financial players entering commodity markets through a lot of, ver you know, I won't go into the details, but there were various measures that allowed them to enter. Now, when uh, the housing market was active, there was less incentive to get in to all these other new things. But when the housing market started slowing down, they're looking for other avenues. They enter commodities. And that pushes up the price. That makes commodities is even more attractive. So more and more people enter. From about 2000, you find that there's a big increase in what is called over-the-counter activities. These over-the-counter activities doubled, tripled, and they really track the futures price, which in the, then starts leading the spot price in all these major things. Normally, a purely hedging market would be ca characterized by what is called backwardation. The future price is lower than the spot price. Increasingly, we have found uh, during that period of price spike up to June 2008 and now that we have contango. The futures price is higher than the spot price. It's driving up the spot price. And that's because, in a sense, there's an expectation of future price increase and there's a speculative activity which is driving up the futures market. The argument that is also given is the index traders rather than the original grain traders or the grain speculators who really, in some sense, oil the futures market. But the index traders only buy long and therefore there's only an upward pressure on the market that is created by the index traders. And this is one of the reasons that you have what you call the contango. That's right. And well, as index traders are part of what I've said, the purely financial involvement in the market, which is not interested in the physical holding of the commodity. Now, the world is more complicated today than it was, say, three years ago, when index traders, I could say, yes, you know, they've, they've dominated and they are the reason. Because increasingly, as financial players have become aware that some regulation is on its way, you know, the US financial reform bill, Dodd-Frank, has got some measures in to control this kind of activity. It's stopping OTC trading. The EU regulation is also planning to stop over-the-counter trading and various other measures. So now, in fact, they are moving into other kinds of ways so that increasingly the kind of financial involvement is changing. So it's not a very clear picture. It's not anymore just index traders that are driving it up. Now you have a range of others. You even have the grain companies doing financial trading because there's a lot of profit to be made in it. So why not? So <laughs> Glencore and Cargill are doing financial activity, even though they're really commodity traders. Are we seeing in some sense a replay of the housing market that more and more complex instruments being created, which effectively push up the cost of the pushed up the cost of the housing market and now are pushing up the commodity prices? Yes, yes, but it's, it's worse because this has a direct bearing on people's lives across the world. The housing market just affected houses in Household. the United States and households in the United States. Here you're talking about the price of essentials. I mean, food and fuel enter into everything. And so what you're talking about is an artificial raising of prices of essential commodities that then get transmitted globally across the world and affect the poorest people. You've argued in one of, one of your mm. pieces that while the prices rise, the domestic price rises, but when it falls, it doesn't fall, which is what you said a little while back. The other issue that comes up is can the countries themselves the, the, can do something about the domestic prices of countries like India, for example? Absolutely. You see, in fact, that's what is so interesting is that there isn't one pattern across the world. There are some countries that have managed it much better than others. Uh, 
in China, for example, yes, there has been food inflation. Uh, pork is the big one, but I'm leaving that out uh, for the time being. But it is still lower than the other inflation. So in China, the inflationary forces are slightly different. It's not led by food inflation. In India, it's very clear food inflation has dominated. And we have been much less able to prevent that global impact hitting us. There's no reason why that should happen because we are in a position to be able to control domestic food prices. We are in a position where we need not import where, unless absolutely required, where we can go in for measures that somehow protect both domestic farmers and producers, uh, producers and consumers from the global price. So we should be able to have less of an impact of the price increase. Unfortunately, our government seems to have decided that we should be affected by the global forces. We should allow the global forces to impact us. I was reading in the paper today that uh, one of our economic advisors has said that we cannot afford to let global fuel prices and food prices go up and not impact the Indian price. The Indian price has to be affected. My comment when I hear things like this is that if all these global prices have to be reflected in Indian prices, what about the price of labor? Wages. Wages. Which of course is supposed to be different from uh, global <laughs> which, prices. Which is very different, very different from, from the global price. price. <laughs> and also an interest in becoming food, food secure, so investments in actual production of food domestically. Yes. But you know, it's again, it's not that nothing can be done in situations like this. Malawi is a classic example. You know, Malawi was another one of those typical African countries that was a basket case. It was always in trouble, always getting into famines, having to import food, etc. Under World Bank pressure, IMF and World Bank, it actually got rid of its uh, strategic grain reserve, what we would call our food stocks. It got rid of it because they said, what's the need? You'll just import when you need it and export the rest, all of that nonsense. So it got rid of it. The next year it had a massive famine, huge devastation, a lot of you know suffering, massive increase in prices, hunger, deaths, etc. The World Bank, IMF and everybody told them, oh, it's because of a failure of governance. The usual thing, it's because of corruption and crony whatever and it's all your fault. Thereafter, the Malawi regime, which is not a great regime in many respects, but they took a conscious policy to forget the World Bank advice, to give subsidies on inputs on fertilizer, etc. to their farmers and to somehow raise smallholder agriculture. Now, they were extremely successful once they actually decided to forget the World Bank advice. They became the most rapidly increasing agricultural production in the region. During the last period of food price increase, they were exporting to their neighboring countries and they were managed to sustain very low domestic price increase for their own consumers. Thank you. That has been a very interesting as we look at the global markets.